gather around so you can all see. Look lively, look lively now. Gather in, gather in. Right. The bayonet. The bayonet is designed for one reason only. That reason you'll become very familiar with by the end of this class. When the bayonet is fixed to the end of your rifle, my goodness, it's got a considerable effect on the enemy's morale. Now, today, I'm going to show you how to kill... Uh, uh, Sergeant. What is it, Ross? Um, so you're supposed to attack somebody with that? Yes, that's right. At the point of the bayonet. With... So you stick that in them? That's right. That's right. You've got to stick it in them. Yes, yes. Uh, well... Sorry, Sergeant. I'm so confused. It's, it's not a very big weapon, and... Well, if you're that close to them, well... Why don't you shoot them? Oh, you. Close quarter battle, or CQB, has been a feature of warfare since its inception. This is true to this very day. Fighting in this confusing and split second environment often focused on the use of the bayonet. Close quarter shooting, on the other hand, in the context of the Great War, was something that received very little attention in training. This was true up to the eve of the Second World War. In Weapons Training Memorandum No. 1 of 1940, techniques were prescribed that would give the men a rudimentary introduction in the form of a simple training scheme to this valuable skill set. The skill set that they would undoubtedly become very familiar with once they set foot on the battlefield. In this series of two videos, we'll explore the techniques as taught to soldiers in British and Empire service during the Second World War. In the first video, we'll explore techniques of the early war. This will, of course, feature the venerable SMLE. In the second video, we'll discuss techniques as they evolved towards the latter part of the war. And these, of course, will feature the number four. I had the opportunity to research and explore this topic when Mike from Bloke on the Range made a visit to my part of the world this past summer. We had a great time researching, learning, and developing practices that would aptly demonstrate the use of these techniques. I hope you enjoy what we've come up with. We certainly had a great time shooting. So the, the general basis for this, uh, it says at the start, uh, firing from the hip. In paragraph one of the general notes at the beginning of this pamphlet, it states that the use of the bullet must not, capital letters, be forgotten during hand-to-hand -hand fighting. A trained soldier can achieve a considerable degree of accuracy in firing from the hip at a range not exceeding 10 yards. Training will be carried out in the following simple form. So what they would then do is the squad would fall in with a line of dummies, which are just sacks filled with uh, filled with straw so the instructor would explain that the object of the lesson is to kill an opponent by firing from the hip at ranges up to 10 yards in other words the range of the bayonet is lengthened so the 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 the, de the, the instructor would then demonstrate and uh, he would demonstrate the correct on guard position So, that is the normal on-guard position. The variation here is that the finger must be on the trigger. So by modern ideas of safety, advancing with the finger on the trigger is kind of a no-no. But back in the day, that is uh, the, uh, the deal here. So, fingers on the trigger. The point of the bayonet is lowered by vigorously straightening the left arm and at the same time ensuring that the butt of the rifle is not lowered or withdrawn. Because if you lower the butt of the rifle, it goes up. And this is a point that we will likely get on to later. So, 
there is a natural tendency to shoot high and you have to really consciously aim low so it is essential that the point must be lower to the opponent's feet and this sounds excessive but you've got this conscious ten tendency to point high so if you consciously point it at the feet it come it should come out roughly in the middle uh, the firing of the round is done simultaneously with the lowering of the point and entirely by sense of direction and then you reload immediately um, and then in the actual drill, which we won't do, the commands are on guard and fire. The training scheme in the memorandum began with dry drills and words of command used to indicate the engagement. For purposes of our practices, we elected to move straight to shooting live. I do hope that's okay with the viewership. The target used for this, the early war technique, wasn't specified as being anything more than a dummy. A straw filled sack. Effective enough, I suppose. We decided to use a number two figure, it being of sufficient size to allow for some degree of, shall we say, learning on where exactly to shoot. It was rigged on a stand that allowed for the target to appear and disappear. A bit of a luxury, enabled by the fact that there were two of us. This also obviated the need to give words of command for each engagement. We simply fired when the target presented itself. The ammunition used throughout this series was my usual cast load of a 210 grain bullet, a top 24 grains of 4227. Weapons Training Memorandum No. 1 did not prescribe specific practices for hip shooting. Therefore, we developed a series of simple yet progressive practices that gained in complexity. There were four in total. Practice No. 1 was two two-second exposures, one round per exposure at a number 2 figure from 15 yards the range being slightly farther than the 10 yards in the memorandum. Practice number two consisted of two three-second exposures, two rounds per exposure, advancing after the first round was fired. So of those uh, six rounds, I made exactly two hits, one there, one there, and high. So the advice to keep the rifle down is entirely correct. It's, it, it's weird, it doesn't feel like it's down, um, but clearly it is. I thought I was pointing it down here, but I'm not. The first few rounds went high, I saw them go over, splash somewhere over there. And uh, so I then tried to consciously keep it down. Uh, reloading on the move for a second shot, it's not actually obvious with the rifle in that position, but uh, I think that's interesting. Let's let Rob have a go. So despite the best advice of the bloke, I only managed two hits. Of course, I was trying to keep my muzzle down, make sure I hit the target, but one, two, center of mass they may be. It's a good way to illustrate the fact that getting good at a technique like this requires a lot of practice and with live ammunition. A luxury that in peacetime and even in wartime, there may not have been to attain really good results like this. The next step is to practice this technique while on the advance, as though we were engaging in an assault on an enemy position and the enemy presented himself at close quarters. Practice number three consisted of two two-second exposures, one round per exposure, fired on the move at 15 yards. And finally, practice four was one three-second exposure, two rounds fired on the move, also beginning at 15 yards. OK, 
Okay, a little bit of practice actually uh, helped. This time I did actually make four hits out of the four rounds. One, two, three, four. It is doable, it does not feel very natural. And I used to shoot IPSC shotgun years and years and years ago back in the UK, in the era when we were trained to hip shoot a bit, but this feels different, it's set up different than a shotgun. Um, I was not expecting to find four hits on that. I thought that I'd at least missed uh, the first ones, but I'm really sorry. I mean, it works. Uh, we, we can make hits. And I guess even if you wouldn't, you'd scare the crap out of someone. Um, so uh, let's uh, let Rob have his go. So two seems to be my lucky number. Uh, one, two, and that's about it. So I know that the very first round I did on the first exposure jacked it into the ground in front. So I was a little bit too low there. You know, that said, if someone were to pop out of a trench or something like that in a round, hit the ground right in front of them, chances are they would have got down, allowed me to close and make us follow up shot or, you know, use the bayonet. Uh, as it stands, uh, I, the assault drill or the shooting while moving is an evolution that adds another layer of complexity to the, the standard sort of static hip shooting because you're moving and getting that rhythm to have one round with a follow-up shot on the same target like that is half again as difficult as simply trying to hit the target from the hip. Uh, extremely fun exercise and I'm sure we could burn between the two of us countless rounds practicing and once we got good at the static, get good at the moving, get good at the running, and I don't know, the jumping and leaping? Nah. That said, uh, this was the approved technique for close quarter shooting. So that brings us to the end of part one. Of course, the exercise was intended simply to demonstrate the concept, rather than a true mastery of the subject, as our round count shows. Still, it was very useful in understanding these early war techniques. In part two, we'll expand on the practices shot here and delve into the later war techniques used from late 1944.